All right, it's Dark Horse time. I was so waiting for this episode. And um, honestly, Mike stumped me. You stumped me a little bit. I'm excited to get into this. Our summer camp MVPs, biggest question marks. Is the team old or young? We get into all of that on today's episode. I'm just surprised you guys didn't try to cheat and you actually picked real dark horses. Real I, I, dark horses. Come on. Yeah, I know you like to try to find a little oh. bit of an edge and, and okay. you know, you, you try to win at all costs, but not this time. So I was just... a little bit, you know, surprised everybody played by the rules. So we'll get into those and so much more. On today's show, we are presented by PJ's Coffee. They got locations all over the city, so make sure you go and check them out. In my opinion, it is the best coffee anywhere in America. And we're coming to you from the Better Call Botto podcast studio. So if you need legal help with any of the following, car wrecks, offshore injuries, 18-wheeler collisions, Maritime and Jones Act, hurricane and storm claims, you better call Botto at 504-323-7777 or 985-303-7777 for your free consultation and case review and check out ideal market they are home of the freshest produce in the city they always bring the best quality food prices at the best prices the home of the largest variety of hispanic and international foods you will find in the state and when i need a hot plate that's the place i go because they have a deli that surpasses restaurants in the flavor of their authentic hispanic dishes and if you are of legal drinking age get a bottle of hard hide ponchatoula strawberry whiskey that is an 86 proof blend of aged wheat bourbon american light whiskey and fresh ponchatoula strawberries Blended in New Orleans, it is not for the thin skin. Look for it in your favorite stores, bars, and restaurants. And last but not least, when you're out and about, if you're up on Veterans Boulevard or make your way there, go check out Firehouse Subs. Those are great people. They do great stuff for the community, and they also have great food. All right, let's get into the show. We're at that time of the year where we're questioning everything. Who's going to be the bright spot in training camp? Who's making the team? What is the shape of this roster? We're going to get into that in today's episode. But first, why don't we just go with the biggest topic? I think this is the one we've been holding on to, the one that we've been wanting to talk about, the dark horse ball. And I feel like we need like a music track underneath that. Brandon can add that later on. But he won't. Saints dark horse. And I think we need to define this because we've done this before where we've like done these roles and all three of us have like a different thing in our head. For me, the dark horse is somebody who is like the 54. Like he he may or may not, like is probably leaning more toward not making the team, but why we think he's right at that 54 and the Saints have a decision to make. Would you guys agree? Is that what Sure, be? but does it have to be like an undrafted? Can it be somebody that's been on the yeah, team? I got yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think no, it can no, no, be. No, 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 no. Oh, it's, you don't think? It's got to be somebody that nobody sees coming. That's why they are a dark horse. If it's not a dark horse, they're a light horse. And you know they might make the team. So it's got to be somebody that nobody it sees coming. It can't be the obvious choice. It can't be somebody that people <laughs> are talking about. It can't be a known commodity. It has to be a guy. When you say it and he makes the team, people are like, you know, Oh my God, who is that? Or where did this okay. guy yeah. come from? Yeah, so it sure. needs to be that type of guy. You pick one now because like, even if they get too loud right. early in camp and it's obvious, they're no longer a dark horse. So it has yep. to be somebody that nobody this sees. This is coming. the early dark horse. Nick likes to put stamps on people. I, I don't question Nick's integrity, <laughs> but he's already put his stamp on a couple of people. Then he backs off of them and he's like, that's it's not my pro- official pick. But if they hit, he'll be like, I was talking about him in the spring. It's a process. <laughs> it's a process. It's a process. Yeah. All right. Who wants to go first for the dark horse? Don't, don't, don't hate the, the player, man. I know. Well, I already know you've stolen my guy, so I'll let you go first. Yes, yeah, it's, it's Anthony Orgy, yeah. and I didn't steal your guy. I put him on, I'm putting him on my 53-man roster projection. That's why so I'm we letting you have him. We already know our 53s here, so we're, we're going to spoil. I'm not going to spoil the whole show, but we already okay. made him. He was actually on my team. I actually believe in my guy, so he's yeah. not your guy. I, he is my guy. I just say go to the reels when the day after they signed all the undrafted rookies. I put my stamp we'll on Anthony Orgy. I didn't, I didn't know. we. I thought we had dibs, I but that's say, okay. I will say, Triplet did. If we were on the take <laughs> he didn't put him on But the I didn't team. put him on he, my 53, so I'm, give, I'm yeah. giving him up. But Mike I'm started him up. the van and the left steam, him on the, the curb. Steam went, yeah. The steam went like he took the coffee pot off the... Yeah, as Sean Payton used to say, see those buses out there? I told Orgy to get on the bus you said hey we're, yeah. we're, we're going man. I, this luck. is what i said boy we really want to draft you this in the fifth round i was calling him we i think we're going to draft you <laughs> in the next round but just in case something weird happens can i call you yeah. later and, and sign you we'll give you a lot of money yeah yeah <laughs> so, so actually what happened with the saints and anthony <laughs> right. orgy actually. so what why anthony well the, it's a handful of things that he's flashed quite a bit throughout camp there were a few guys if anthony johnson hadn't got hurt he was someone that that would have been probably one of my picks too i like some of the stuff he did but that's a crowded position 
So it's just a combination of, of flashing how much they paid him in, in uh, mm -hmm. free agency to sign here over $200,000 guaranteed. That doesn't guarantee you a spot on the team. And that's pennies in NFL money, but it's meaningful in some sense that there was competition to get him. So that says other teams thought he was good. And then it's opportunity. If you had to pick one spot for a guy to come out of nowhere and make the team, linebacker is the yeah. most wide open position. So it's just A, B, and C, I think, yeah. just, just equal to a pretty easy dark horse. All, all those things are the reasons why I picked him the day after the draft, too. Mm -hmm. The money they gave him, the position he's playing, it's like, if you're going to make this team, it's at linebacker. But the thing that I like about him is all the guys he's competing against are 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 not rising above. Like, I, I liked him a lot. And we've only seen small flashes. Yeah. But I like him a lot better than I like Nick Anderson, unfortunately, even though he's the, the local guy. And then even the established guys like Zach Bond, DeMarco Jackson, you know, nobody's like, Andrew grabbing Dow. that yeah yeah, yeah. so could be knocked off so so the opportunity is there the thing the other thing i really liked about him um he led the sec in tackles per game last year like he's a real legitimate player he led vanderbilt in tackles for three straight years like he is a legitimate player but at the same time core special teams player even though he was their captain their leading defensive player and obviously that's the path to making the team but because i because i knew i had to give him up to nick because nick actually put him in the 53 minutes which, which i admire i did not put any undrafted rookies on my 53 man roster this year. Um, but I'm going to just name a guy that nobody's talking about. Cause we, we talked about the kicker battle mm -hmm. so many times. Um, I, I haven't seen Blake Gilligan falter or anything, but I feel like he's in more jeopardy than Will Lutz. Blake Gilligan has had one wow. great year and then one disappointing year with the team. And the guy they brought in Lou Headley, he's legitimate. He was a, he was a second team, all American punter at Miami, uh, two years ago. Um, <laughs> he turns, he just turned 30 years old. Like he's a grown man, undrafted rookie, because he was an Australian rules football player, a scaffolder in Australia. Has then a he mean opened it. Then he opened a tattoo shop in Bali before deciding I should try this football thing. Went to San Francisco City College, went to Miami. He's lived a life, man, but he's got a real leg. So that's a competition we we haven't talked about. We we talk about opportunity. He has one guy to beat. That yeah. Really good dark horse. I actually was surprised. I'm actually kind of surprised. We really, surprised. we've never talked to. I don't know, I know why. I don't know, like, and if you looked at all the draft guides, Lou Headley was always a top five yeah. punter. Blake Gruby was not a top five kicker. Blake Gruby has been more of a surprise, which is why we think we talked yeah. about him. But when they brought in Lou Headley, they were saying, "Oh, we went out and got one of the top rated is, punters." Is Headley the the veteran in this battle? Yeah, like, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, is it based on age or? I don't know. He's the old guy in the room, though. Yeah. So, I, so. And look, I'm I not saying it. again. Yeah. I'm not saying that he has outperformed mm -hmm. Blake Gilligan, but it's just Blake Gilligan struggled a little bit last year, and they brought in one of the top five punters that yeah. was available in this year's draft class. So it's a competition we should pay attention to. Yeah, you stumped me on that one. I yeah. feel like I'm going to get called a, ho a homer for this one, and that kind of gives away my answer. Uh -oh. I'm going Nick Anderson. I just, I just dumped on the guy. <laughs> I know for my dark horse and for, and it's for a multitude of reasons. Number one, every one of our dark horses better be on special teams. Obviously yeah. punters a little bit different, but your dark horse has to be able to put up on special teams. And that's one thing that Nick Anderson has done since he was a freshman at Tulane. He's he actually interviewed him after he signed with the saints. I think he's played four or five different roles consistently every year at Tulane. And if there's one thing, Willie Fritz does well is it's getting guys ready for the NFL. And he puts almost every guy that's on defense through special teams drills and through actual live game reps. And Nick Anderson has gotten those. So I think number one, he's going to be really hard to take off the roster for special teams alone Two, I know people might get tired of hearing this, but the leadership and the value that guy brings from a mental standpoint yeah. into a locker room makes a difference. I mean, that guy's already hanging around Derek Carr, Michael Thomas. You see him having those conversations with those guys. He's a glue guy. He can go in and bring a group together. I know for such a young guy, that sounds outrageous, but that is Nick Anderson. And two and three, he's going to be somebody that's going to make it really hard for you to keep him off the field. I know size is just going to be the thing that continues to, to beat him. We've made the Sam Mills comp. Obviously, I think Sam Mills is a lot more stacked and built mm. than Nick Anderson is. Nick Anderson definitely doesn't have the frame that Sam Mills had. They were both kind of the same height, but that frame is the biggest difference for me between the two of them. But I think Nick Anderson has a real chance at making not just special teams, but that third linebacker spot right now. We yep. have not seen Zach Bond solidify that. Andrew Dowell has kind of off and on, off and on practice squad roster, things like that over the years. And DeMarco Jackson hasn't done anything to prove that 
he is going to be the starter there too. So I think Nick Anderson is the true dark horse in that spot that for all those three reasons, special teams leadership and what he can do at the linebacker position, tackling in space, go pull up his tape. I mean, mm. I want to see him tackle in space against Kamara. That's the one thing I've been waiting to see is I'm <laughs> or, like, like, can you get somebody like Kendrick Miller? Yeah. Yes. Can you get somebody like that down? And if he proves that in camp and maybe he's already proved that when we're not out at yeah. practice in some of these viewing windows, how can he not make the team? Well, and, yeah, all, all these linebackers, when they're actually yeah. in pads, will get a much better In pads, team. he makes – not, and it can't be one. If he can make some consistent tackles in space that we saw at Tulane and even in the Cotton Bowl, this kid can make a difference. And he was on – don't forget, in the Cotton Bowl, he was on the safety that ended up giving Tulane those two points and keeping them in the game. I mean, he's a grinder. He's a guy who is going to bring people together. He's my dark horse. I did not have him on my 53 – because as a dark horse, you kind of have to like yeah. keep him right there on the fringe. For me, he's that 54 that's going to flirt with the practice squad and the roster this year. Yeah. Now, you did almost put a undrafted rookie running back, I think, on your 53. That was one of your late cuts, too. Yeah. So that's another position where it comes. For your loose definition of dark horse, though, um, I don't. we all picked undrafted rookies, which I think is the term. But for the people who aren't paying close attention, we all, and, and this will just be a sneak preview, we all had some kind of surprise picks, I think, in the secondary. Mm -hmm. Now, some of those guys are fifth-year veterans like Ugo Amade or Isaac Yadam or, or Smoke Monday yeah. who's here for the second year. So they're not all guys that came out of nowhere. But there are some names that might end up in this roster that people aren't thinking of off the top Would of it be head. the biggest shock if Smoke Monday did make the 53-man roster? Did or didn't? If he did. Would it be a shock? No, not a shock. Not yeah. a shock. We've seen him high, high on the order. I yeah. think people like him. They like having him around. The teammates talk highly about him. I, I think that the fan base thinks more of them maybe than than the team does, but I think the team thinks a lot of them too. And and I'm just saying that because the fan base thinks yeah. they they talk about him like he was like a top ten pick. And, <laughs> you know, I think there's still a little bit more to prove than that. But I, I do think the team likes him. We saw him get some mm -hmm. uh, first team snaps this week. So, yeah. but by no means is he someone that's just kind of like coming out of nowhere. I think he, he has pretty good standing in that in that uh, depth chart right now. Anytime I hear his name too, I always think about how Tyron Matthew like kind of put him under his wing too. Like Tyron saw something in him and was like. Like, hey, I'm getting you on a plane. Like, we're going to go train. I, I invited him to his house for dinner. Veterans don't just do that for anybody. Yeah. Like, they have to see something in you to be like, all right. Like, I think you yeah. might stick around here in New Orleans. I talked to, to Smoke last week, and I asked him a question about Tyron, and it was the biggest smile I've ever seen come <laughs> on someone's face. Like, there was, like, a whole tone to the interview, and then, like, I asked about Tyron, and he just, like, he lit up, and he's just like, man, it's just, like, an unbelievable resource. So, you know, that's something that we hear from a lot of people, though. I think Tyron's impact on that group has just been kind of crazy oh, yeah. overall. I would no agree. question. Okay. And I, I'm going to use Nick's wording on this. Is, this. is this team old or feels old? Isn't that crazy to old. say? They've so looking at the 2019, 2020, 21 draft class, it, it really is when you look at the breakdown, it's like, oh, like this is more of an older group, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's... There's definitely an effect on this team kind of having three drafts that are a little bit empty in terms of just depth. There's some good players out of those classes, but there weren't a, a lot of hits through those years. And when you look at the team, it's kind of top heavy and older guys. And then there's young guys who are like, well, maybe. And then just kind of that it, there's like a wave missing, I think, in, in the construction yeah. of the roster where where there's not like these people that are pushing the old guys out. Now you're kind of holding on to the old guys because Look, let's just go through the names. 2019, they they hit on Eric McCoy, CJ GJ. He's not here anymore, so he's not a long-term part of their their plan. So just in terms of long-term planning, it, it's a miss. While he was here, it was definitely a hit. Uh, Saquon Hampton, that's a miss. Mac, that's a miss. Caden Ellis didn't stick around. 2020, Cesar Ruiz, eh. Like, maybe he's part of the future. Maybe he's not. Zach Bond, definitely a miss. Troutman, a miss. Tommy Stevens, possibly the worst draft trade in Saints history. <laughs> 21, Peyton Turner, right now a miss. Uh, Pete Werner, definitely a hit. Paulson Adebo, a hit, but not a foundational piece. Ian Book, miss. Landon Young, decent depth. Kwan Baker, you know, nothing right now. So out of these three drafts, I think... That's glaring. Yeah, I think Eric McCoy is the only foundational piece in three drafts. And, and you need more of those to make sure that you are having that wave and, and you are pushing your old guys out. And that's kind of why it feels like they're at a place now and then... When these guys start aging out, there's kind of like a little bit of, you know, ricketiness to, to their path going forward, I think. Just real quick, would you call Pete Werner a foundational piece too? McCoy and Werner? Or yeah, two well, I, I mean, potentially. I would even ask, yeah. I would ask, I would ask, I would add uh, Paulson and Debo to that too. I don't think he's done. He might not even start this year though. So like as far as like I don't know guys if I'm ready to say around, that. 
Yeah, but that, yeah. I don't know. He's a guy that you look but at. And you found say, he, like, yeah, he's yeah. not on that level. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. McCoy right. and Warner are the two solid hits. player though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's there's Pete Warner's a foundational piece. I think McCoy's foundational, and Adebo's good, like a very good good Ru- player. Ruiz yeah. is in the next tier too. I think there's still time for Ruiz to. Ma- he's yeah. a maybe though. He's a maybe. Stay maybe. healthy. Um, no, you can't overstate this topic. I mean, I've been saying this since I first joined the pod, and last year we had a lot of uh, discussions about what direction this team could go because I'm worried that they haven't reloaded the cupboard enough and they are relying on so many 34 mm-hmm. year old 30 plus year olds on this team and 2017 was a long time ago and this is a lot of misses and look you could throw 2018 into this mix because um marcus davenport was the guy they used two first round draft picks on that's why the 2019 draft class uh looks so weak and 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 obviously we've litigated marcus davenport over and over again but that that really killed them that he's not mm-hmm. on this roster anymore because that's two first round picks so 2018, 2019, 2020, that's four years of of first-round picks that haven't hit. I I mean, I think we really need to see it from Cesar Ruiz. He needs to go from a maybe to a, yeah, okay, that worked. And and we obviously need to see it from Peyton Turner. And we obviously need to see it from the 2022 class. Um, Otherwise, uh, this is going to be... It's not going to be the way they manage the salary cap. Mm-hmm. I, we all, we all, you know, fight all the time. Like, no, the salary cap didn't sink this team. It's going to be that they didn't reload if, 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 if more of these guys don't hit. Yeah, Peyton Turner's getting real close to being in the red. I mean, oh yeah, he is by far. I think when you guys agree on the list, has to, has to have a season this year. He's, like, he's, star- like he's staring down the red. He's there. You know, he's getting pushed into the red and trying to push back at this point. Yeah, yeah, no I, question. It. It, it's crazy to me, too. I mean, we go out to camp and we watch these guys. He has everything that he needs. Size, length, yep. speed. Put it together. Be healthy. I, You know, I we've talked to DA. How many times have we asked him, yeah. like, what's the missing piece? What does he need to do? And it it seems simpler than it is at this right. point, right? Well, he needs to be on the field consistently. Like, So that does go to injury. Like, injury isn't the only excuse with him because, yeah, he was a healthy and active sometimes last year. But... um Injury is the reason why he hasn't able to build consistency and stack. And 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 this year, knock on wood, he's been healthy so far. Um, maybe he has the chance to do that. I don't. I don't think his story has fully been written yet. Mm-hmm. But there's plenty of reason to be skeptical. Yeah. And, and with that, we kind of get into like biggest need after OTAs and after mini camp. And to me, it's still linebacker. Yeah. The, it's your, the position is your biggest concern yeah, still, yeah. It's still my biggest concern. Look, and we've been beating the drum on this. Like, they didn't go and draft a guy, which is fine, but you also didn't br- really bring anybody in new that is bringing competition to that role. I mean, we talked about Nick Anderson, and but it, it I was shocked that they didn't go get, like, a veteran linebacker who's coming in, and you see more of, like, the competition heating up between DeMarco and Zach Bond yeah. and whoever that third person would have been. I, I I'm shocked that that didn't happen. Yeah, we were talking about dark horses, and we everybody wanted to pick a linebacker. I wouldn't be surprised at all if if the number three linebacker on this team wasn't even on the roster during during OTAs and minicamp. Uh, the biggest thing I still need, like we had a lot of questions answered, I think during minicamp that we wanted to see. Mm-hmm. Um, but but the first day we show up, I want to you know Mike is going to continue to be a question, but I also want to see from a health standpoint. I, I think it would sure be nice to see. Trevor Penning and Cesar Ruiz, speaking of draft picks that need to hit, I'd like to see them lining up in the starting lineup from day one and going through a full training camp. Um, the, the, you know, I, Mike and O-Line are probably two different answers. Is either one your answer that I won't go into? But overall health, those those are the two things I care most about on this team. Is is Mike part of this team? And are Trevor Penning and Cesar Ruiz part of this team? Because if they are, um, I probably feel pretty great about how things are looking. Yeah, no, I mean, you guys covered it. I, I think a line is an area that makes or breaks the season, probably. Oh, it, yeah. it may it may be a linebacker injury. I mean, those are yeah. those are definitely the the points where I look at it and think, you know, those are the things that keep me up, like when I'm thinking about this team for sure. I think it keeps up Doug Marone, <laughs> like that guy. <laughs> oh, no question. I mean, you talk about somebody who has come in and has made a difference with this team. I don't think we talk. I mean, we did talk a lot about Doug Marone when he w- was first brought in, but the way he is able to bring a lot of these younger guys up to speed. Like I'm ready for him to unlock Trevor Penning. Like, let's see this guy out there. Doug Brown has had his hands on him now. What for almost two full off seasons. And like, let's see it. And two, we've, we Andres Pete at left tackle. Is that going to be a potential James Hurst play, getting the guard spot? Like I think Doug Marone's doing a little bit of teetering and figuring out too. Like, yeah. Hey, I've been here long yeah. enough now. I see where the strengths are at. He probably can, 
can mask injuries, I think, a little bit better this year, too, with the point. offensive line. I mean, line. that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, that, that probably is some of Marone with Pete playing out of position. It is him trying to figure out, is there a better way to do things yeah. than they've, they've been done? That, that's that's a, that's a good observation. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm sure he's feeling the heat. Like, if I'm DA, I'm like, hello? Like, I need you to keep these guys healthy. And if our starters are not healthy, we need to be rolling guys Everything they want to do in. bases on uh, yes. the offensive line being functional at the very least. It, it, it could also be exceptional. There is there's a path to it being an yes. exceptional. They're all first-round draft picks on the offensive line. They just need to play. I think, too, we talked to Eric McCoy. We've talked about this before. But the fact that the offensive line can feel like they are want, can play more freely because of the quarterback you have now. You have a quarterback now who's calling things out on the line that – maybe we haven't unlocked a part of Eric McCoy yet that we haven't seen. I mean, the guy blocks 40 yards down a field, but well, how is he going to look now with a little bit of pressure off of him is going to be yeah. something I'm looking forward to seeing. Yeah, me too. Look, I, I said this, I think previously at some point, I, I think his rookie season was his best season. And then the last two seasons were a little bit shakier yeah. when there's some of that off his plate. I, I do think that he's going to be able to perform a little bit better. What do you call him? Hype beast, summer camp MVP. Let's just get into it. All right. Who are we hyping the most after Ootas and minicamp. Yeah, I mean, I'm 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 locked in on Chris Olave. There's, there's say, no there's question about like, it. Yeah, <laughs> I think he I think he has the potential to be like one of the top guys in the NFC, and that's a stacked class of people. The stuff we're seeing is is extremely encouraging. He's taking his game to the next level. He understands things. He's playing more physically. It's early. There's no real contact, so maybe it's a little bit overdone. But he is far and away, I think, just dominated these practices. And I, I think it's just something that we haven't seen in, in a camp in a while is a, a offensive player just really kind of like lock in and take over. And it's happening in a way that that's different. It felt like a lot of empty calories at these practices before. Oh, so-and-so went four for five passing, but there weren't big plays. There weren't highlight moments. Like that you are uh, selling Marquez Callaway short. He, he, <laughs> he, he lived for preseason practice highlights. <laughs> I know. If only it translated for the end of yeah, the season. I mean, come on. You know what? I'll give Those Mark weren't empty calories. That was so and so went four for four for eighty yards with a seventy-eight yard pass to Marquez Callaway. I'll, I'll give him they some, turned out to be yeah. empty though. There weren't a lot of those. On like, there there weren't a lot of big plays. Like there were. Yeah, there were yeah. like it was frustrating offensive yeah, practice, yeah, very and much, it was almost yeah. like. You would leave and, and you you know, we do the practice session and there'd be like a play of the day thing and you'd be trying to like, yeah, boy, was it this slant? Like, yeah. you know, like yeah. what was it? it yeah. And now there's like actual like, damn, like I yeah. wanted to go with this one, but this play was better. And it's different. It's just a different feel. I think it's the playmakers. I think it's the quarterback. I think it's I think it's some of the play calling. It's all yeah. of the above. Mark was Callaway two years ago. Two years ago. I meant two years ago. He Mark deserves was Callaway. a little more credit when Michael Thomas was out two years ago. <laughs> he was probably Mark everybody's play in. of the day like 18 yes. times that summer. Yes. Obviously, Sean Payton saw something and he just snatched him up, took him to Denver. These so. dudes weren't really getting open, though. Like, yeah. Marquez yeah. Callaway wasn't actually like, he, he wasn't open. Yeah. He didn't make the spectacular contested catch. There's a story about one of the coaches saying, like, hey, can you like run faster? I'm like, no, it's like, that's all you can do. Like, <laughs> that's it. So, I mean, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, Alave's on another level. I want to hear yours too, because I have a lot of this person also deserves mention. I have a hard time putting anybody above Chris Alave. Sure. Like I, I truly do. And I I tried to think back to, okay, what did I see last year? What have I seen just in brief OTAs and mini camp? Because training camp is really where I, you get to see these players and how they've made an adjustment. You put the pads on, just all the things. True 11 on 11, like that's where we'll get to see things. But I think back to last training camp, we talk about contested catches, but it really was glaring for Chris. And I think it was because the size, it was him going up. Number one, the heat. Let's give him a little bit of credit. Played at Ohio State, was from Cal is from California. He's not used to the swamp. So the heat number one, I felt like he handled very well in his rookie camp. But the contested catches, I would just remember I'm like, damn, you're getting pushed around over there. Yeah. Like Anytime I'm trying to think of who he was matched up with in, in training camp last year, but I was like, Chris, like stiff somebody like they're, they're giving you, they're pushing you around for a reason. Like they're trying to give like the rookie, you know, th like the weight that you're going to feel in an NFL game. And I, and it almost like he he was getting frustrated last training camp. Like, man, they're just beating up on me. Like I'm getting like two on one. No one's beaten up on Chris Olave this year. Yeah. I have not seen one person body him. And no. I know you're not in, I know you're not in pads yet. But he just looks more confident. The weight he put on that, I mean, he said he did what he said he was gonna do in the locker room with us when the season ended. I want to put on weight and like be more yeah. aggressive. 
check check like you did both things yeah look there you know if we have to pick one he's he's the obvious yeah, choice easy. Yeah. It's, it's easy i don't choice. know what brooks said too like last year at camp line one in his scouting report was doesn't make contested catches <laughs> so it was something everybody was watching so every single time he was in one of those things he took notice of it and yeah he there were questions going through camp and i felt like when we got to the end of camp they weren't really answered there was a period during the season where he had like two or three games where he made them and then all of a sudden it was just like you know complete catches to the ground and people uh bullying them and stuff all season so definitely it was it was a thing the all last summer and it's just different it's yeah. different from day one last year yeah. you just kind of were looking for it and you were trying to find reasons to dismiss or confirm like preconceived notions and, and there was just never really any reason to and dismiss. it makes you feel better about the team at all you're like overall you're mm -hmm. like they've got i mean it makes you feel better about the offense i mean you you need to have the the guy that you know can be a wide receiver one the, um, hold the, up hold up though we aren't saying it's solved we're saying it's on the it's on the right path right but yeah. it, like but yeah, yeah like it's I not just, just, just to, yeah it's not just an page. individual yeah. player doing his own individual thing it's like that that makes everybody else's role fall yes. into place yeah. if if he lives up to his potential another candidate though that could win this award um is michael thomas just because there's nothing that was a bigger deal this summer than seeing what we've seen, yeah. you know, over the last couple of weeks with Michael Thomas and being like, he's here early, he's committed, and you know, he looks like he's on the right healthy track. I, I feel like that was the storyline mm -hmm. or or the most most uh, uh, promising thing we saw. Uh, those are neck and neck for most promising thing. And then, I mean, you could obviously talk about Derek Carr. I mean, quarterbacks usually always win the MVP award. He's done everything that that you wanted to see from him. He looks like he's taking control of this team. And then we just mentioned uh, Tyron Matthew earlier. He's not going to win the MVP award. I just want to mention him as an honorable mention, though, because actually there were a couple guys, him, Demario Davis, mm -hmm. Cam Jordan, that, that were here the whole time, so the defense shouldn't get the shaft. And and when they weren't out there on the practice field throughout OTAs, they were going out doing team bonding things. Every, I mean, that was something we wanted to see this summer and and seeing the leaders take control of that. So. So there are a lot of candidates, but yeah, Chris Olave wins. Yeah, and a lot of those questions will get answered in training camp. We can't wait to get to those practices. Thanks for joining us on another episode of New Orleans Football. We'll see you next time.